the last video by finishing off the two handles to this knife. That worked out really well, but there were some big issues that need to be solved for making more than one of these. So the handles were bent up from here to here, you know, in this direction. They were bent up, kind of a bow shape like that, about 20, 30 thou, which is, you know, obviously far out of tolerance. Um, this was just because when I did the parallel process, the parallel tool path over the top of these handles, um, this operation here, they bowed up. And because I removed the material, they bowed up in the middle here and here, because I was also only holding them by screws here and then screws in there in these holes here and here. To try and fix this, you've already seen a little bit, I redesigned the jig and had the handles next to each other. Um, this way I can put a screw here, here, and then of course the four screws in the handles. And uh, spoiler, it does work a lot better this way. The um, bending um, was almost entirely removed by this, um, or at least the process of making these. Um, when I made these handles, they didn't bend up as much. Um, but that might be because when I cut these handles out, I cut them in one direction in my material. And I think it turned out being that the grain of the material, um, all materials have some sort of grain because when they're rolled out, they get stretched. So those crystalline structures get stretched in one direction. So I believe the grain was in this, the long direction on these handles. When I cut out the pieces of raw stock for these handles, I cut them in 90 degrees to them. So I think the grain was this direction. So that might also have helped, but it's also a big deal is that I'm using these handles. Um, so I was able to bend them back straight, just using an arbor press and three um, points of contact. The big thing is, in this jig, they would bend up halfway through the operation, so any operation after that would then cut differently because the handles were bent. In this case, they're still held down, so even if they do have tension that wants to bend them up, and once you remove them from the jig, they might be bent, in this case, they'd stay not bent until you've taken them off the jig, which is a big deal, so that I get good parts even if I have to bend them back. But all the other features are correct, as if they were flat. I don't know if that makes perfect sense, but basically it's better to hold them flat so that they can't move. You know, kind of obvious stuff. Um, so yeah, I've made these, this jig, and I'll show some sh pictures of that. And then I did something different on this one as well. I, instead of having uh, machining features that are locating pins into my material, I just drill and ream them out to, here, let's see. I just use a boring operation and then press in hardened pins, um, 3 16 pins as locating features. Um, this way, the I'm not relying on the strength of aluminum to um, really the wear resistance of the aluminum. Yeah, I'll show some video, some pictures of its um, pretty simple part, just face it off and then drill all the holes. I also added this, which is just, uh, these two are just 440 tapped holes to hold it down and then another locating pin. I can make the blades. Um, if we go back over here. Okay, there we go. So you can see this is going that's the raw stock of the blade. These are just a spot drill and then drill them out and then bore out the center one as the locating feature. This of course is on a different jig, just on a um, scrap piece basically that I can just clamp it to and do these locating features. And then it can go back on located with a pin here and screwed down here and here. And then I can go through and do some features, a little engrave and then cutting it out and doing this groove. Um, obviously I'm leaving the bevels to be done by hand later. I just, I want to be able to hand grind my bevels. It makes them, you know, fancier knives. And to cut out these bevels would be an extra operation and just a really long operation that I don't want to do. But now this one jig, can I can now do a whole knife, the big, you know, handles and blade in one go. Um, the operations for cut, doing these these handles are basically the exact same, just 
obviously orientated a little differently. Here's the back side, just grooving out the um, Bach bar clearance, I don't know, um, relief area, and then the front side, typical things, boring out these holes, cleaning them up, uh, cutting them out about halfway, the parallel operations, then some engraving, um, just my name there, and then I, this is a change I did, um, is I added a chamfer all the way around um, the handles so that they all look pretty much the same. Um, and I don't have to do as much hand filing or polishing afterwards. I also have a chamfer on this lock bar part because that's really hard to um, deburr um, by hand. And in here, same thing. This makes it look a lot better too. And then just the final cutout. Um, I have pictures uh, as I go through the steps of making four, well, three handles this way, and then I have a fourth handle that I made this way, and you guys have already seen in the past video. Here's the raw material, stainless steel and titanium for um, four new knives. Um, I ended up only ending up with three new knives because one of those pieces of titanium, um, I crashed an end mill into, so I ruined it, but four pieces of stainless steel, so... Um, one for the handles I already made and then three more for the other ones. Here's the new jig um, to hold the handles side by side instead of end to end. Um, haven't pushed in the pins yet. Um, I just did that off camera. So there you go, you can see um, just a pair of handles sitting on there the way they will when I'm using the jig. Just drilling the locating holes for the blades. That was the clearance um, for the 3 16th hole that I'm going to bore. And then this is clearance for a 440 screw, so an 8th inch drill bit. So this is what it's doing. Just two 8th inch holes and then one board 3 16th bolt hole. And then there's a couple more blanks that I'm about to run. Eighth inch end mill to bore out that hole. Here it's drilling the clear the first holes for the handles. So this is a piece of titanium. Um, basically the same setup in the machine though. Just some clamps to hold it down. Um, yeah, pretty simple. Here's uh, three finished. The fourth one crashed in this operation, so. Now it's doing the inside the handle features, so the clearance for the um, lock bar or the relief for the lock bar, engraving um, the name and serial number, and um, the stop pin blind holes, um, as you can see in the picture on your right. So, flipped it over, so all those features you just saw are on the back side now. You can see these screws are now in their countersinks. Um, so yeah, we're doing the front side, which is a full 3D path with this eighth inch ball mill and then a couple other end mills, uh, one sixteenth and one eighth flat. So yeah, we're going to run this. There you can see the tools I'm using and we'll start. This is just a parallel operation. So you can see it's only going in a climb cut, which is leaving a much better finish than going both ways. It felt fine going both ways, but it didn't look perfect, and it looks so much better, so. Yeah, just kind of cool. And it didn't take much longer, just the rapids on this machine are high enough that it doesn't matter when it's already an hour and a half cycle time.
second ones, first ones. Same step over, but this one's one direction. This is both directions. You can see this, it looks like a bigger step over, but that's just because every other step over is a nice finish and every other, the other every other one is a bad finish. These aren't perfect either though. The, um, the bevel is a little bit too deep. I'm not 100% sure why, but they still look pretty good. I mean, they're, they're better looking and I can just do a little hand polishing on these and it'll look really nice. The name's a tiny bit too deep. I reset off that tool. I think it was off by a little bit. Number one, you can also see the engravings a little different. And I think it looks a lot better now. This is just a single line. This is like, it's trying to do just a, lines just a little bit set off of each other. This is a different font where it just does one line and it looks, yeah, a lot better. So, there's another one running right now. Hour 11 minutes, should take about an hour 33. Here's what the blades looked like once I took them off the machine. Um, from here on, everything's just handwork. Um, fitting the um, lock bar and the stop pin and stuff, and then grinding the bevels, polishing. It's all by hand. Um, there you can see I just removed the um, scrap material and deburred them just with a file. So, hey guys, um, yeah, I just wanted to check in and talk about what I've been doing. So, as you can see, I've got one knife all put together. Um, yeah, I just, I didn't film any of this because I just wanted to go through the process and learn um, without having to think through like filming as well. And um, I'm glad I did that. I learned a lot. This one isn't perfect. The lockup is pretty good, but it's not perfect. It's just, yeah, I'd like to work on it a little bit more than this one. It's a little bit loose, but it's really close. It's better than any other knife I've made so far because it locks up and it stays locked. It's just, it isn't quite as, um, how do I explain this? This is just a little bit too far forward. So this really stops because it's out of spring motion, not because it's hitting the knife blade, which is really close, so you don't really feel a difference. It's not really loose, but either way. I wanna fix that on the next one, and I think I can. I understand what I did wrong, and um, but I got the angle and stuff right, so that's good. Everything else about it works great. Um, it's really beautiful. The anodizing, something I've been, I just started doing yesterday, actually. Here you can see just me messing with some of the colors. This was, so I'm just cranking up the voltage and then lifting this out. You know, I'd start with like, I don't know, 10, 20 volts and then 30, 40, 50, maybe. Uh, this might have gotten up to like 100 down here. I know this one, this green here, I definitely got up to like 110 volts. And then these are just kind of the range of colors I can get. And this is how I kind of picked the colors for this knife. Um, it's kind of a bluish, so around 50, 60 volts on this side. And then this goldish, which is about here, which I think is what, 70, 80 volts. Okay, so I have the little parts for these. So pins, these are stop pins. Um, these are the 3 16 length screws, now those are the 8th ones, uh, 0, 80, and then these are the 3 16 ones, 6 32s for the pivots, spacers, the bigger diameter ones, these are the smaller diameter ones, um, obviously the washers, Teflon, and then the um, 1 32nd pins, which are for the um, lock bar stabilizer thing in here. And then, of course, the pivots I made. Um, so, I've got those. Now, I'm just going to start assembling a knife. So, the pivots are good and tight, so it's easy to get it in there. Triangle lined up and pushed in. And then, the blade, and then I just dropped in a stop pin. So, right off the bat, I just put it together and just feel it. Um, there's a ton of interference. I can feel it's really stiff here and here. Um, could try putting it together here, see if it even goes in. Yeah, not really. So, this tells me that 
you know, I need to open up this slot, obviously, and I can look in here and see that the pin is rubbing on the outside. So, to correct this, I'm going to go over to this little um, kind of router table thing and open that up. I'll show you that. Okay, so this is something I just made. So it's just using a little air grinder. And then I just made this, which is just a piece of aluminum. Just grabs onto it. Then, then it's just screwed onto a little table. And then I have a 1 16th diamond burr in there. So I can just drop it into my rubber vise. Or I might make a hole in my table so it's more permanent, but at this point I don't really care. Open up this groove where I want it, where I need it to be open, basically. Really, um, obviously, because of this table, I can keep this slot very square. If I was doing it by hand, it's easy to get kind of a bell shape to the end, to the edge of the material. Um, and I don't want that, so this is just an, you know, idiot proof and a lot easier. So I can feel there's a little roughness there, a little bit there, so it's good and loose from there. But I can also see that that's, I need to open it a little more, which is easy enough. And then, yeah, it gets really stiff up there. So just continue to open it up. So I can still feel there's a little bit of interference right around here. So I'm gonna open it up just a little more. And then I'm going to fully assemble the knife and make sure, because right now, I expect this to move easier than when it's fully assembled, because this pin, no matter how accurately I reamed this hole, is going to have a little slop side to side, and so is this um, pivot, but once it's in a handle, it's going to be held tighter with less movement. So any interference here that I might not be feeling right now, because this pin's moving a little bit out of the way, um, we'll definitely, I definitely feel once the knife's fully f assembled with, um, you know, a spacer in and all the other stuff. So this takes a while and you have to make sure you're checking it in, um, its final state. Otherwise you might, it might work here, but not when it's fully assembled. Yeah. So now it's got a good move, closes in about the right place, opens, could open a little bit more. I think it needs to open just a tiny bit more. It looks a little, something's off about it. Yeah, I'm going to open up just a tiny bit more, keeping in mind that, once again, once it's together, I expect it to... Um, all these movements to be a little less because these pins will be held tighter. Yeah, that looks better now. Looks about the same as this knife. And we'll adjust it a little bit more, but I want to do a full check. It assembled, so let's go assemble it. So now we can assemble it. It's really easy right now because I'm not fighting against the lock bar because it's not bent out yet, which is a big reason that I don't bend out the lock bar until this is all pretty close because I don't want to have to be fighting with it or anything. So there's that. Okay, so really stiff in that area. It's good here, good and smooth. I have it tightened just a little bit too much. It's hard to tell. There we go. It's about right. It's stiff. Yeah. So it's rubbing a lot in this section. I'm going to do that a couple times. I got plenty of lock bar. Okay. So 
There you can see that the lock bar, there's still some meat to set the lock set to get the um, correct angle on the blade. Um, the opening probably should let it open just a little bit more. And then it gets stiff about here and is stiff for the rest of it to a degree that I can't even get it all the way closed. Okay. So now I'm going to go back over, open up that groove a little bit more and just keep doing this until I like it. And then I can set the lock up. Okay, so here's the um, blade, and I'm just going to start out by just doing a little bit of filing, just to get the lock face set. So, I'm using a really fine file, it's a good file too. Um, Not that that actually matters, but getting good files is a good, um, you're going to use them a lot, and the better they are, the faster they go, and the longer they last, so there's no point saving the $5 or whatever on really cheap files. Um, so, there you go. Just a little bit off, I don't want to go too far, and um, it's hard to tell, but getting a slight angle on there too. So, yeah, I've done about half the face. That's just a starting point. I don't want to go too far. And maybe a 20 degree angle. Okay, I'm just going to put this together. Okay, so now things get a lot more difficult than they were before to get the knife together because the lock bar is bent out. I like to get one screw in to kind of rough align it so I don't have to worry about other things as much then I can really get a better grip on it and tighten this screw up a little bit there we go still looser than it will be in the end one more screw out here no need for a second just because there's plenty of locating already now a little too loose Tighten it up. Okay. So, I'm going to zoom in on this and see. Here's the lockup. Um, I have a little bit more, not a ton, which is good. It's about right. Um, like, I mean, it's not, it's not done yet, obviously, but I have material to work with, and it isn't too loose, which is the main issue, because obviously this I can keep removing material. Okay, let's look at this lockup. So, there you go. It goes about halfway across the blade. It's not to where it, the, um, this bar is jammed against the blade. It isn't gone all the way to a point where it's just where you bent it to. It stops before then against the blade. And I can't get it knocked loose, which is important. I'm whacking it against the, my hand. Um, you could even hit it against the table. No lock. Didn't come unlocked, which is a big deal. Important. And it pushes across pretty easily. Um, so yeah, that's the lockup. oven. Let's throw that in there like that. And then the program's correct, but then this is how I'm going to cool them down. So we'll pop that out. So we'll slap it down here. Boom. Boom. And then really hard so that they get good full contact. And then, yeah, that should work great. It's obviously a lot more difficult when this is at 1800F, but 
you've got a little bit of time because just being in the air isn't actually bad for them. So, uh, this is just 320 stone, stoned finish, both sides. So, yeah, it's not perfectly consistent yet, and it's not as fine a finish as I want, but it gets rid of most, all the um, scratches from grinding. And then from here on, just using 400 grit paper, and then 600 grit paper, and then maybe gray scotch bright, I can get it looking really good. Yeah, really thin edge, um, probably... 10 thou at most, which is what I like. Okay, so here's a number three assembled and working. I just need to sharpen it. And you can see I did a light blue anodizing on the titanium handles, everything else silver. I think this looks really good. Subtle, but yeah, really cool looking. So here's number four. I just polished these handles, so they're a little dirty, so I gotta clean them up. I start with just denatured alcohol. I just buffed them with, um, you know, a wax compound on the buffing wheel. So you gotta get them all that wax off, obviously, and then all the finger grease and everything else. But start with alcohol and some hard scrubbing to get all that out, especially out of the engraving and stuff. So yeah, I'm going to anodize these kind of a bronzy color, because I think that looks really good. Kind of like the back of this knife. I think this is a really cool color. But a big part of anodizing is keeping them really clean. Um, this is, I'm not an expert at this at all. This is like the fourth or this might be the fifth piece of titanium I've really ever anodized. Um, I've gotten it down enough that I can get a good result, um, but I'm sure... There's more to do to get really good at this, obviously. Um, but a big part of it is getting it really clean. Um, I'm using Windex and Clorox bleach, and then several different rinses, and then um, muriatic acid um, etching um, to get the oxide layer off. Um, yeah, you can see, got a good finish on these. It's green compound on a soft buffing wheel. I don't know if that's a really what grit that means, but it's a good high polish. And um, use titanium wire because it's it doesn't react with in any of the things any differently than the handles already do, so it won't cause any weirdness or contamination. Where steel definitely will. Um, it'll react pretty badly with the muriatic acid. Um, so you don't want to do that. You definitely want to um, use something else. Um, I'm sure that you can do some research, but it's much better just to use the same material so that you're not getting anything weird. So you can see I put a little bit of a um, kink in the wire so that they don't touch each other too much. A little bit of spots on the inside is okay because you can't see that, but not full contact or anything. And now I'm going to go over to my ultrasonic cleaner, which I use as both a warming bath and the cleaning to start getting these up. Um, here's the blade, once again just ground and up to about 600 grit. So here you can see this is my ultrasonic with, um, this is muriatic acid, this is 100% Windex, 30% bleach, and then just a, um, just pure water as a rinse, and then I have another thing of water down here, which is a cold rinse, and then over here 
is um, borax dissolved in water, and this is my solution that I anodize in. So I have an electrode, which is once again just scrap titanium, and then a piece of rubber so that I don't short out anything. I don't want to hit the two electrodes together, obviously. So then I have the negative electrode go to this, and then this connects to the red positive, goes to the part I'm anodizing, and then I can adjust the voltage on this here. So you can see I have a voltage readout, and I can um, adjust it up and down to up to about 110 volts or so. So this is my setup right now, and then the order that I'm putting, that I'm cleaning things in, I start in the Windex, then I'll rinse it, put it in the bleach a little bit, and then keep looking at it and see if the water breaks. So if you um, hold up a piece of metal and water beads up on it and drips off, it's not perfectly clean. There's a little bit of an oil layer or something on the top. So, and it's not clean enough for anodizing, you'll get a spotty finish. So you have to keep doing it in these um, Windex or bleach keep cleaning it until the water is perfectly wet to the material. This is, takes some time and um, I have this at 40 degrees C, whatever that is in F, so it's at 120 maybe, um, F. Then I turn on the ultrasonic for three or five minutes between it and just keep checking it. Um, it takes a lot of um, cleaning to really get it that clean. Um, the first few times I did it, I got kind of spotty finishes, and I didn't realize how much time it really took in really um, strong cleaners. I mean, just pure bleach is pretty, is a strong cleaner. And then um, once it it doesn't break, the liquid's on it, I rinse it, and then I put it in the muriatic acid for 30 seconds or something. Um, that's definitely a point where I don't really know if it's working, but I can tell that the um, it does give a better finish, um, but I can't really see any difference before I start anodizing. Um, but this is really kind of caustic stuff. Um, it starts smoking and stuff. Um, so I really don't recommend using this without a mask and um, maybe gloves. Um, and then you definitely, I don't know if you can tell, but this lid, I had the muriatic acid in here and it attacked this um, mason jar lid pretty quickly. So I put it into a plastic container so that it doesn't react. And then um, it even looks like it's reacting to the stainless steel on this cleaner. Um, so definitely just be careful with this stuff, but definitely gives a better finish. It gets rid of the oxide layer, I guess. Then I go into the bleach to um, react with the acid and um, neutralize it so that the um, parts don't have any acid in it at any other point. Then I clean it a couple more times, go through another cleaning process, and the, um, once it's reacted with the bleach, I put it back into the Windex and turn it on, and then I'll rinse it off a few times. These are now rinsed off, and now they can go in here. Okay, so I'm going to slowly go up the voltage. Okay, I'm at 12 volts, <clears throat> and I can start seeing that the titanium is changing just a little bit, a very light bronze color. I'm going to go up just a little bit more. I'm at 14 volts. Yeah, you can tell the color's changing a little bit. Get this out of here, just kill all the voltage. Now we can pop these out and take a look at them. And there you go, you can see that really nice bronze color. It's sometimes hard to tell without someone next to it, so without a good silver next to it. But I can see that these are really nice. Really nice bronzy 
color. And good and consistent. Yeah, that went really well. Here's um, one of the handles on the prototype number one, the knife I'm carrying. Um, as you can see, really nice blue color, but here it is um, once it's been used. You can see the blue color. Um, once it gets dirty, it changes a little bit. Um, I did a nice light bronze on the other side of it, so it's kind of a dual color knife, as you can see here. Um, yeah, I really like this. That I was kind of messing around with different colors, anodizing and stuff. Here's um, the one on the left is the one you just saw me anodize, and then a light blue one, which I anodized right before it. Um, these ones I just did one color for both handles. I think they are both really nice. I like both colors. Um, there you can see my knife on the right and then the other two knives. Um, but yeah, these all turned out really well. Um, so yeah, thanks for watching and I hope you guys have a good day.